Ahmet, welcome to the Building and Growing podcast. We're delighted to have you here today. Well, it's my pleasure to be with you, Lucas. Thanks for your invitation. You're most welcome. It's uh, uh, good to be, you know, in this seat after many years ago being, you know, student teacher. It's now podcast host and expert. Well, I mean, uh, it's really uh, very fulfilling for me to see my ex-students uh, to become uh, excellent professionals. This means that at least we uh, managed to teach you something, you know? Indeed. indeed. <laughs> <laughs> sure to shake your head him. And now, uh, hopefully, you know, I continue to be a professional. Let's yeah. see. Um, you will. You will. <laughs> um, it, um, today, you know, we're going to be talking a bit about private equity and, and, and funding. Yeah. But um, before we dive into that, it'd be great if you could tell us and the audience a bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm a, a financial markets veteran with like 30 years of experience under my belt. I always work in Turkey though. Uh, and uh, I started uh, as a, a fund manager, then uh, moved on to uh, head a brokerage house uh, in Turkey. Yes. And then uh, set up an asset management company for, uh, HS, for the HSBC uh, in the last uh, part of my uh, career uh, and uh, at HSBC where I was employed for 13 years wow. I was uh, heading both the brokerage arm of the business and the asset management uh, subsidiary of it and then in the last five years of my tenure over there I set up the uh, principal uh, investments desk of HSBC in Turkey Principal investments is like a, a quasi a private equity fund. Mm -hmm. uh, the main purpose is that you are investing into uh, companies. In our case, it was the intention was to invest into Turkish companies like a private equity fund would do. Sure. Uh, with the intention of selling them at a premium, hopefully. Uh, but the only difference is uh, we were not raising funds from the uh, uh, third party investors but the funding would come from the balance sheet of the HSBC itself. Yes. So at that time, HSBC was expanding this business and they were setting up uh, country-specific, region-specific desks all over the world. And we set up one uh, in Turkey. Uh, this was from 2008 to 2013. Okay. And uh, we were looking into opportunities and we did one investment and one exit during this period of time. After I retire, uh, I took on uh, teaching. Uh, I'm teaching at Koch University at the Graduate Business School, finance uh, courses Fantastic. for the master's students, as you uh, <laughs> well know. Yes. And uh, I am an independent board member at uh, Anadolu Hayat, which is a private pension uh, company. Yes, fantastic. Well, look, what an introduction and what a career, you know, across. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I, you know, you're clearly passionate about financial services, going from, you know, brokerage, asset management, setting up funds, private equity, and now educating, uh, you know, future professionals. The cycle is completed. Yes, <laughs> indeed, <laughs> indeed. And I mean, you know, it takes a lot, I guess, of passion for the industry to stay in it for it so long. It definitely does. I mean, uh, I was lucky because I was able uh, to find new challenges for myself over this uh, 30 years of time yes. by, uh, you know, focusing on certain uh, areas of the finance and then moving to another stage and then moving to the other uh, stage. And private equity was the uh, was the climax of it okay. because in private equity you need all those skills yes. that I have accumulated over time. Okay. Uh, okay. You need uh, the uh, investment banking experience, uh, how to uh, conduct a M and A process, uh, how to do a IPO at the end to exit, yes. if you like. And then uh, you need uh, business strategy and planning in order to identify a five-year growth plan for the company. Uh -huh. And then you need uh, some managerial and entrepreneurial skills yes. to uh, 
to run this uh, investment period on your portfolio company in order to achieve the best results mm -hmm. Fantastic. at the end of the day. So uh, it was a melting uh, pun, uh, I would say, yes. of all these skills in order to survive in the uh, PE world. Sure. And for those um, in the audience who don't know what private equity is, are, are you able to explain what private equity is? Sure. Uh, private equity fund, uh, first of all, it's a fund, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, a mutual fund. Yeah. It's an individual entity uh, set up in a country. Uh, uh, and consider this uh, fund like a pool mm -hmm. where uh, the investors are uh, putting their uh, money uh, into that pool. Yes. And then uh, there is a, uh, another party, uh, we call them uh, GPs, general uh, 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 partners. Yes. Uh, they are the, uh, in charge of deal sourcing, negotiating, executing the uh, um, uh, acquisitions, yes. managing the company, exiting uh, from the company at the end. Uh, in short, they are in charge of managing this fund mm -hmm. on behalf of the investors. Yes. And uh, so the money is in the fund. The uh, GP, general partners are looking for opportunities. Once they found it, they let the uh, investors know about this and they wire the uh, money uh, into this uh, pool mm. and with this uh, money, they acquire the company. Okay. This is how it works. Yes. Now, the question is, who are these uh, investors? Indeed. Uh, this is what we call in the PE jargon, LPs, the limited partners. Yes. Okay. The uh, limited partners are most of the time uh, qualified institutional buyers mm -hmm. or uh, high net worth individuals. Yes. Because the uh, ticket sizes are quite uh, high, mm. therefore the private equity fund is not uh, suitable for retail investors. Yes. Uh, it, shall I say? It hasn't been democratized, let's say, like no. uh, there's no Robin Hood for private equity. But it is coming. Yes. Uh, thanks for touching on that uh, point. I was just reading it uh, yesterday. There are now uh, fintech companies who are taking on this pain point. Okay. Uh, and uh, they are setting up platforms where the individuals yes. uh, or retail uh, investors could invest into a feeder fund. Yes. And through this feeder fund, they will invest into a private uh, equity, writing a large check. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. It is a, a second layer of pool, so to say. Mm -hmm. And uh, this will not be uh, enough uh, for retail investors uh, to attract into the PE, because in the PE fund, we have a liquidity problem. Yes. Yes. Once you enter into that fund, it is like a catalog marriage. Mm -hmm. And uh, you vow to stay there for 10 years. <laughs> you cannot get out uh, before the uh, fund is uh, wound out. Yes. Uh, and for retailers, it might be a very long term commitment. Indeed. So it will take time. These platforms, they are working on uh, creating a a secondary market mm. where the retail investors would trade those shares uh, among themselves. Okay, yes. Okay, without without it. redeeming it uh, to the big fund, uh, to the private equity fund. Uh, okay. But other than that, uh, the uh, largest players in the LP world are the pension funds. Oh. Because they have the huge dry powder under their belt. Yes. I mean, uh, the $36 trillion wow. uh, are saved uh, under the uh, pri uh, private pension funds. Yes. Or public uh, pension funds. Mm. Uh, actually, the largest funds, for example, in the U.S. are public pension funds like CalPERS, California Pension Fund for Public Employees. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so it's... Uh, is an example. And they've got a long investment time horizon. Exactly. Since it's a 
pension business, mm. your time horizon is 20 years, 30 years. And yes. uh, during this time, you would like to generate the highest returns uh, for your uh, for your clients. And uh, uh, traditionally, they were uh, investing into equities mm. and into fixed income instruments. Yes. But uh, this uh, allocation is changing over time because uh, they are seeking uh, enhanced returns mm. to provide a better future for, yes. the, for their beneficiaries. And uh, they found this uh, answer uh, in the alternative assets. Yes. Alternative assets uh, is uh, right now having like a 9 to 10% share mm -hmm. in the total portfolio of the pension funds. Yes. And uh, it is, it refers uh, to the uh, instruments like hedge funds, mm. private equity funds, infrastructure funds, yes. real estate funds, and uh, art funds. Yes, indeed. Uh, so these are uh, new types of uh, uh, investable domain with uh, higher returns. Yes. Uh, and they will be used uh, to enhance the traditional uh, income stream of the uh, pension uh, companies. Mm -hmm. In addition to the uh, pension companies, we are uh, seeing uh, more and more uh, the, the uh, sovereign wealth funds. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the uh, wealth funds of the uh, most common ones are the oil rich companies. Mm -hmm. Uh, or the one, uh, the countries uh, which run huge current account surplus. Yes. They accumulate a lot of uh, foreign exchange mm -hmm. and uh, they need those foreign exchanges to be invested abroad. Yes. Uh, the typical ones are the Gulf uh, countries. Mm -hmm. uh, in Asia, you would see uh, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong. Yes. Uh, Taiwan and uh, China. Yes. Uh, in Europe, the largest one is Norway. Yes. Uh, so they accumulated a lot of wealth. I remember you, funds. You, you telling us that in our, uh, our class back in 2016. Yes, <laughs> the picture hasn't changed yeah. except for the fact that they're getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> and uh, since then, the Chinese uh, ones are coming up. Okay. Uh, they are uh, overtaking the uh, Gulf country. Uh, sovereign wealth funds in terms of size, oh, wow. in terms of assets under management. So they are the uh, typical clients. Yes. The third party uh, are the endowment funds of the universities. Yes. They are managing uh, huge uh, endowment uh, monies. These are the uh, funds transferred to the universities from their alumni yes. donations. And uh, they are they cannot spend this uh, money, mm. but uh, they have to uh, invest it and they are entitled to spend the income of that portfolio. Okay. So if they can manage this portfolios better, yes. the higher would be uh, the income uh, stream uh, into their annual budget. Indeed. For that reason, they are chasing after uh, higher returns as well. And we are seeing more and more, more uh, money is channeled mm -hmm. to these alternative investments over there. Other than that, uh, insurance companies, banks, yes. uh, are the typical ones investing into private equity. Fantastic. So we've covered the what private equity is, um, why people invest in it, or you know, people and in institutions um, uh, perhaps because it's not correlated to traditional asset classes um, and, you know, who those players are. Are you able to talk us through what the typical process is when making a buyout or an acquisition um, or when, say, a private equity firm makes a buyout or an acquisition? Well, uh, first, as a private equity fund, uh, you have to identify your investment philosophy. Uh, you can be a country-specific fund, you can be a region-specific fund, or you can be a global fund. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, if you are a country specific, you will only invest into Turkey or into the US. Yes. If a region specific, you will invest in Europe or in Eastern Europe. There would be MENA funds, Middle East, Northern Africa. Mm-hmm. There would be uh, Asian funds, yes. uh, Latin American funds, Latin funds. So these are the region specific funds. Mm-hmm. Uh, or if you are a global uh, fund, this means you can invest wherever uh, you like. Uh, then the question is, what are you going to invest? Mm. Again, some of the funds are uh, generalist. This means they can invest into any sector, mm-hmm. into any industry. But uh, most of the funds uh, do prefer to specialize mm-hmm. on certain uh, industries okay. so that they will accumulate know-how Yes. in those uh, industries as well. This is the know-how for uh, for uh, executing the deals. Yes. Uh, this is the know-how for managing the companies in mm-hmm. those sectors. Because if you are, uh, if you have specialized in healthcare sector, yes. you know how to manage a hospital yes. in the US, then you can transfer this uh, know-how into managing a, a hospital in Turkey mm. or in UK. Yes. Uh, and maybe by managing uh, several uh, hospitals in the same country or uh, over the uh, different regions, you can uh, you can uh, benefit from cross sales. Yeah. Uh, you can benefit from the uh, transfer of the best practices to the other ones yes. and you will uh, know who are the buyers for the next stage who are the main players in this sector Indeed. So, uh, and if i might add you can also reduce your costs because you're buying wholesale exactly the group. exactly there would be a lot of uh, benefits from the economies of scale yes as you have pointed out therefore the uh, investment philosophy Uh, should be uh, set up at the beginning. Yes. And this is actually uh, shared with the investors before they are making up their mind. Okay. Uh, this is what we call a, a investment memorandum. Yes. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the outline of a limited partnership agreement. Mm-hmm. Oh, in this uh, memorandum, you are setting up in which regions you are investing, in which uh, sectors you are investing, what are the uh, no-to-go uh, areas yes. for yeah. you. For example, if you are uh, you know, shaping a fund for the investors from the Gulf countries, mm-hmm. probably you will not uh, invest into alcoholic beverages business. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So uh, you have to take into consideration the sensitivities uh, of your investors. In, investors. So uh, after that, you uh, start your search. Uh, you will do a desktop search. You will uh, go and uh, meet with the deal uh, suppliers. Mm-hmm. These are the uh, these are the M&A houses. These are the large investment bankers, and you will raise your hand and say, "Hey, I am a fund, and I have five uh, hundred million dollars uh, to invest mm. in these countries, in these uh, sectors. Do you would do you have any deals uh, to share with me?" Yes. Uh, so uh, either you yourself uh, would do your work, or you will cooperate, and the. In ideal world, we do both, mm-hmm. uh, so that we will have the maximum uh, exposure to all the most likely candidates yes. available in the market. So you keep keep the funnel open by collaborating Definitely. with Definitely. as many players. The as ears possible. and the eyes, they are <laughs> all open, uh, checking the emails all the time. Yes. to search for uh, opportunities. A recipe for a good work-life balance. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Then, uh, once you have uh, these targets uh, in front of you, you will do uh, more desktop research, and you will, uh, uh, you know, move from a large universe, probably a smaller one, 
and then you know once you narrow it down to 10 or 15 at most mm. you will then reach out uh, with the representatives of those companies or with the managers of those companies okay. to have a one to one meetings mm. if you are working with the m a houses and investment banks most of the time they have a very structured m a process mm -hmm. uh, they send you a teaser where they summarize you uh, the key characteristics of the company this is like couple of pages long only mm. uh, if you are interested you sign a non-disclosure agreement mm -hmm. uh, after that they send you uh, the financials of the company yes uh, once uh, you are knowledgeable about what's going on mm -hmm. you may ask to schedule a meeting yes after that they ask you to submit your non-binding offer Mm -hmm. if you are interested yes and this is a process with all these milestones and with timelines mm -hmm. okay so uh, after you sign your non-disclosure agreement you will do your uh, preliminary due diligence and analysis uh, then in two weeks of time you will s submit your non-binding offer oh, wow that's a short period of time it for some big deals. Is, uh, time is money in this business. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the, uh, it uh, goes really uh, fast. Yes. That's why having uh, sector-specific know-how is important because Indeed. it shortens your period of evaluation. Yes, yes. Uh, that now you can compare it with your previous deals, with the market and other competitors, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So uh, once these non-binding offers are uh, collected, yes, uh, the advisor, uh, the sales side advisor, uh, uh, evaluates them with mm -hmm. this uh, company, and then they identify the top three uh, runner-ups. Yes. So this is the short list. Mm -hmm. uh, then they are giving uh, another like two months of time. Mm -hmm. uh, for a detailed uh, due diligence, confirmative yes. uh, due diligence, uh, so to say. And what would that involve? Oh, it involves everything. Yeah. It involves everything. And uh, in this uh, stage, you have to invite in all types of in, uh, advisors yes. to work with you on this deal. Mm -hmm. uh, you will have legal advisors. Yes. You will have uh, financial uh, advisors. Mm -hmm. You will have uh, strategic uh, advisors. Yes. Uh, they will be all uh, analyzing different aspects of the deal. Mm -hmm. uh, with your legal advisors, uh, you will uh, work on the shareholder agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, you will negotiate the shareholder agreement with their support and it will be drafted by them. Yes. And then it will be negotiated with their counterparty. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it is not uh, the only thing that they are involved. They are checking in legal due diligence on the company's obligations. Okay. And entitlements. Yes. For example, the company may give you a list of the uh, deeds mm. they own. Yes. Is it really they're, uh, they're under their ownership? Yes. Are there any pledges or encumbrances yes. of those uh, titles, uh, deed titles? Mm -hmm. Is it clear? This is something you will need to yeah. be, uh, analyze. How many litigations are opened against the company? Mm. Are there any issues with the competition board? or regulatory bodies yes. are there under any investigation mm. uh, how many litigations the company has opened up against the third parties yes. this will fall into the uh, legal uh, due diligence okay on the other hand uh, in financial uh, aspects we work with the audit companies yes. we run a detailed audit uh, of the company mm. uh, to see that the financials uh, reports reflect the true self of the company. The EBITDA is the real EBITDA. Indeed. indeed. Uh, and the debt uh, is whatever they say. Yes. Uh, so on and so forth. Uh, then there would be tax advisors mm -hmm. uh, to check the 
tax liabilities of the company. Yes. After that, uh, we work with uh, commercial or strategy advisors mm. uh, to see uh, where is the industry heading. Yes. Uh, what is the competitive age of this company? Mm -hmm. How we can uh, take this company to the next stage? Yes. Because if you do not know and shape a strategy before you acquire the company, what to do with this company, yes. that M&A will fail at the end. That's okay? right. The, uh, so, all these contributions of these advisors mm. uh, helps uh, to build up a 100-day plan. Okay. okay. This is what you will immediately execute right after you, uh, the full ownership of the company is transferred to you. Yes. Uh, and through this, you know exactly whether you have to change the top management. Mm -hmm. uh, you know exactly whether or not there are some uh, businesses which are uh, secondary type of businesses. Therefore, you are much better off by uh, divesting them okay. and raising cash. Yes. You uh, also know how much debt you will need to raise mm. for acquisition finance and for the uh, networking capital needs of the company or for the further investments of the company. Yes. These are the uh, issues that you address before uh, buying uh, the company. Mm. And at the end of the day, if you cannot shape up a clear a game, a game plan, mm. then you will not buy it. Yes, far out. You will not buy it. Well, look, that, that was a, a very detailed uh, uh, summary. Um, so let me try and just go up one level and, and do a high level summary. So you're really starting off the process by working with different M&A houses and investment bankers to keep the funnel open, to keep your eyes and ears out for every single piece of opportunity. You look at different, let's say, investor memos or teasers from the M&A houses, you shortlist 10 to 15 um, companies. Um, you can do a little bit of a, a two-week period of due diligence before submitting a uh, non-binding offer. Then the private equity firms are shortlisted into, let's say, three potential buyers. There's a two-month period where you're doing due diligence with bankers, uh, or say financial advisors, lawyers, and business or industry experts. And the goal of that is to produce a 100-day plan so that the company um, uh, you know, can see who the most attractive buyer is in terms of what next steps they would take afterwards. Um, and at that stage, they choose a buyer and there's a buyer. Yeah, and the heat ratio is to percent. Wow. Okay. So you start your funnel with 100 companies. Yes. At the end of the day, if you invest into one or two companies, you consider yourself quite successful. Far out. Yeah. That's incredible. Yes. And, it, you know, and it shows how much work actually goes into this. Exactly. Because I never exactly. would have guessed that, uh, you know, that type of ratio. Um, because there's a lot of work involved in getting to one or two. Uh, it is uh, very time consuming. Mm. And also it is a financially uh, expensive uh, process as well because you are paying uh, huge amounts of money to work with all these advisors. Yes. And at the end of the day, if it's uh, not going through, you got stuck up with all these expenses. Yes, yeah, far out. That's a, uh, a difficult position to be in. It is. Yeah. It is. So, Ahmed, that, that was a fantastic summary of uh, the private equity um, process and all of the stakeholders involved. But um, we hear a lot about venture capital. Um, and, you know, I know I've worked for a couple of companies that have been VC backed. Um, what differentiates private equity from venture capital? Well, uh, actually, uh, they are similar in many aspects but they are different in many uh, other features as well. <laughs> uh, maybe I have to, uh, I should uh, explain this within this uh, company life cycle framework. Yes. Uh, for different stages of the a company's life cycle, mm -hmm. we have different types of uh, private equity uh, funds available. 
Okay. Uh, if you are an entrepreneur and if uh, you are starting up your company, yes. at this stage, uh, the, what, what we would call is uh, R&D stage, yes. you will run your R&D about your product and you are just burning cash, there are no revenues, uh, but you have to uh, you know, devote all of your time to do this work, so you need funding. Yes. Where this uh, money will come uh, from? It will come uh, from uh, bootstrapped, mm. which is the money from uh, family and friends. Mm. Uh, actually, there is a third group, family, friends and fools, yes. uh, <laughs> who are very courageous enough uh, to invest into just an idea. Indeed. Uh, then... Uh, once you detail it and uh, you start to work on your uh, MVP, minimum viable product, mm. maybe you will go and knock the doors of the uh, angel investors yes. uh, to provide you a seed capital. Mm. But uh, still, uh, the funds you will be raising from there will be uh, quite limited angel capitals. Okay. Uh, investors, they will provide hundred thousand dollars up or up to two hundred thousand dollars at okay. most yes uh, with this you will work on uh, mvp then uh, comes the time to hit the market yes you are going to launch your product or your service uh, for this you need marketing mm -hmm. you have to uh, set up uh, sales teams yes uh, this means you will need huge amounts of cash yeah. to burn. That's it, and especially this, if you're doing digital marketing. And, exactly, uh, <laughs> like exactly. Like fireworks that pop away. <laughs> uh, at this point, you go to the uh, venture capital uh, mm -hmm. companies. They are investing uh, at the early stages yes. of the company when the company is still not uh, profitable. Yes. yes, there are some, rise, uh, some signs of revenues Mm. You, we, we call it uh, uh, traction. Yes, traction. Don't we? Yes. Uh, <laughs> so you have some traction. Mm. The revenue is there. You capture the reactions of the uh, customers and the feedbacks is coming there. Yes. You see how the competition is doing. Therefore, you have a better idea yeah. about your viability. Mm -hmm. uh, so venture capital will enter at that point in time. Yes. The MVP is there and you are ready to hit the market. Mm -hmm. uh, once uh, you uh, survive this stage, you will need further funding. Mm. And when we look at the startup companies, we see that there are several rounds of financing. Indeed. Uh, you know, a round of financing B, C, yeah, yeah. and in the precede, uh, uh, precede a little bit earlier yeah, exactly so on so forth mm. and then now the company is uh, running its life mm. uh, at the uh, early uh, stages of this capturing the market yes. but as you know uh, the, uh, time is money in this business mm. especially for these startup companies as well yes uh, they will need more and more funding mm -hmm. in order to capture a larger market share in this game. Yes. And uh, the early entrant has always uh, the advantage. So if you would like to dominate the market, mm -hmm. you have to grow uh, very fast before uh, the other ones uh, are following your right. footsteps. So this is where you are uh, burning the highest uh, levels of cash. Yeah. And this is where you need larger equity stakes mm. to support you indeed for that land grab for that land grab exactly yes. this is where the growth funds yes. are coming into the picture so they will uh, you know uh, try to support you through this exponential growth mm. uh, of this company yes once uh, you reach uh, to the highest level mm. uh, of your market share you are hopefully a market leader. Mm. You captured a significant portion yes. in the market and uh, you are profitable. You are making uh, money uh, after 
painful years of uh, suffering. <laughs> uh, at this stage, you can do an IPO mm. so that all these venture capital uh, companies or growth funds will have a window to exit mm. and to realize their returns. Uh, or you will uh, sell it uh, to a larger fund, mm -hmm. which is the leverage buyout funds. Yes. They are investing into market uh, leaders mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they do this uh, with the help of the acquisition loans. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we call them leverage buyout funds. Sure. And they invest into market leaders and most of the time. And then uh, after uh, you, know, you enjoy this market leadership position, uh, hopefully a long period of time, Yes. Uh, eventually there will come a point, either your product or service is outdated yes. or uh, your competitors are catching up with you. Mm -hmm. So you will start to lose market share. Uh, the revenues will not increase uh, by the same uh, growth uh, rate, yes. uh, you will be reaching to the, towards the end of the, your life cycle mm -hmm. and actually to the section which goes down the hill. Yes. Yeah. And uh, if you do not manage uh, this uh, period well, you will run into financial problems. Indeed. Uh, this is the stage where the distress funds are entering into the scene. Yes. Uh, they will uh, buy uh, those fallen angels, yes. so to say, and they will try to make a turnaround story out of this yes. and make them uh, uh, come back mm -hmm. uh, into the game. Turn them around. Yeah. Turn them around. And uh, so this is the uh, whole life cycle. And as you can see, through this life cycle, different uh, funds serve the different needs uh, of the company. Yes, indeed. And that's a fantastic you know, end to end from bootstrap founders um, uh, to you know, raising money from family and friends, angels. And you've got the pre-seed and the seed rounds from, let's say, risky uh, uh, risk appetite VCs and then you know, series A, B, C uh, uh, and so on from more growth stage VCs before coming into IPO or leverage buyout stages. And I'm always very interested in the distressed uh, funds because, you know, sometimes they're, you know, for something which is worth $1, they're paying, you know, 10 or 15 cents for exactly. the dollar. Exactly. Um, so it's exciting for them because it gives them the opportunity to turn the business around. Yeah. <laughs> and the most uh, famous one is uh, Cerberus. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, uh, the... Uh, the, the, the Cerberus, uh, the, uh, in mythology, what does the Cerberus stand for? No, no. Uh, it is the dog of Hades. Okay. Hades is the underground uh, god. Yes. And uh, Cerberus uh, is the guard of the uh, underground world. It sits in front of these gates and it has uh, three heads. Yes, okay, wow. Yeah, no, I so haven't heard. they give this name uh, to their fund, the, yes. the Cerberus fund. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, no, I haven't heard of that before, but I need yeah. to look it up. Yeah. Excellent. Is this a... <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we've discussed a lot about the PE um, cycle. We've talked about at what stage private equity investors would come in. Um, but what types of firms would seek um, private equity funding? Well, uh, for different types of uh, funds, there would be different uh, matching companies, yes. so to say. If you are a leveraged buyout fund, mm -hmm. this means you will be investing into uh, market leaders, the large companies, so to say. Yes. Uh, and uh, this will require huge amounts of uh, financing. Uh -huh. And these uh, leveraged buyout companies each of them would be like 15 to 20 billion dollar of size. Wow. And uh, they uh, chase mega deals yes. in, in the markets. Uh, and uh, in order to execute the, those deals, mm. uh, they like leverage uh, their uh, equity by two or three times okay. and, uh, on each deal. Wow. Uh, I mean, uh, one of the largest deals was 
from 1980s. Yes. Uh, this was the when KKR, the private equity company, has acquired the RGR Nabisco company. Okay. Uh, and with today's uh, uh, prices, yes, the total ticket size was around eighty billion dollars. Far out, yeah, that's so huge. One single company, yes. they paid like eighty billion dollars, and it's a huge amount of yeah. money. Did did it survive? Is it still around today? Uh, partially, yes. partially. Uh, I mean, uh, it uh, RGR Nabisco. Uh, it, Originally, it was a RGR, yes. a Raymond uh, James, uh, the tobacco company. Okay, okay. The owner of the Winston Salem and the Camel brands. Uh, yes. Yeah? And uh, when uh, you know, the, all these tobacco companies were under regulatory inspections and the healthcare issues were climbing up, yes. they wanted to you know uh, they wanted to rebrand re it mm -hmm. that uh, they wanted to rebrand themselves yes uh, so uh, they started to acquire food companies yeah. to claim look we are not only a tobacco company but we have strong revenues coming from uh, the food yeah, uh, business as well supply. so they brought uh, they bought the craft Mm -hmm. Kraft is uh, the largest uh, FMCG uh, brand. Yes. They produce the ketchups and the mayonnaises and uh, ready uh, soups. Yes, yes. Uh, this kind of tin soups. <laughs> soups, uh, powder soups, whatever you uh, <laughs> call it. And, uh, you know, uh, it was a very large uh, cash printing uh, company. Okay. Uh, the, the best brand of uh, craft was Oreo. Oh yes, yeah. Uh, just still uh, in the yeah, market. Yeah, still, yeah, it's still delicious. It's as still ever. delicious, exactly. <laughs> and uh, they say that uh, every American ch children born, uh, the moment they are born, they were asking for Oreos. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, KKR has bought it. But after that, uh, things didn't work out uh, that well yes. because there were lots of uh, investigation whether or not smoking was related with the cancer. Mm -hmm. First, they denied, yes. but then uh, they were found uh, guilty yes. uh, for hiding the truth from the public. And uh, they agreed to uh, pay a huge fine, yes. $250 million, oh, wow. to man. cover up for the Medicare expenses they caused yeah, uh, to the society. <laughs> and so uh, the, uh, the tobacco part didn't work out indeed, uh, indeed. as uh, expected. However, they uh, successfully uh, sold out the food park uh, part. Uh, raise some cash to pay back uh, acquisition loans. Mm -hmm. Then they uh, uh, did the IPO for the company, so on and so forth. Okay. So s some of the uh, these large uh, deals are quite successful. Some of them are not. Yes. So the uh, RGR Nabisco was one of the cases. And there is an excellent book written about it, Barbarians at the Gate. <laughs> uh, it was the bestseller for yeah. a long period in time. And then uh, they may, uh, shoot the movie uh, on oh, that wow. deal as well. So uh, we are watching the movie in my private equity class with my students. Yeah. And we are discussing uh, this case study. A fantastic title. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there, uh, uh, the, another largest uh, deal was the Texas utility deal. Mm. Uh, they bought the Texas utility company, yes. the power generator company, uh, uh, yeah, and then you know the 2008 crisis came in. Uh, it was uh, supported by a heavy acquisition loan. Yes, with you know business cycles going down the demand for electricity declined yeah so the revenues didn't meet up to pay the acquisition loan oh, they had right. to restructure uh, there were some uh, troubled times yes uh, over there as well but uh, 
I mean, these type of leverage buyout uh, transactions are mostly uh, conducted with the uh, market leader companies yes. and the companies that are listed in a stock exchange. Okay. Most of the time, they are 100% listed. Yes. So yes. the private equity company makes a bid. It could be a hostile or a friendly bid. Yes. And then uh, collects the shares from the market, owns 100% of it, and then they delist the company okay. and makes it private. Yes. One of the cases, for example, is the Dell company. Yes. Yeah. Uh, when the Dell company was growing, uh, the owner, uh, the uh, founder, uh, had to That's sell uh, yeah. his shares and it became a mi uh, into a minority position. Mm. The company is listed, Michael Dell. Yes. Uh, and after a while, uh, you know, uh, he didn't like being a listed company. He thought that uh, if they are private, they could be more agile yes. and uh, take decisions quickly and grab the opportunities immediately on the, yeah, stop, yeah. On the spot. So they des uh, he decided to take his company private. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but it requires a huge amount of money. Mm. Invited private equity houses. Yes. So yeah. they did another leverage buyout. So, uh, the private equities cooperated with the owner yeah. to take the company uh, private. Yes. So uh, these type of uh, transactions, like the in the example of Dell, yes. they are mostly for listed companies that uh, are uh, publicly uh, traded in the stock exchanges of developed countries okay. where 100% uh, of shares are listed. Yes. If you are paying such big bucks, you would like to be sitting on the uh, driving uh, seat of the uh, car and you would like to have the full control. So Did the they? private equities at, uh, for this type of transactions are interested in full ownership okay. uh, types of transactions. Yes. However, uh, when you move on from the developed uh, markets to emerging markets, the profile is completely changing. All right. In developed uh, markets, uh, there are not that many listed companies. Yes. Most of them are unlisted, uh -huh. uh, privately owned. Uh, the listed companies are, uh, and even the listed ones are not 100% listed. Okay. For example, fashion. in Turkey, yes. uh, the average uh, listing of, a, uh, of the uh, companies is around 35 to 40%. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, so you cannot make a hostile takeover yes. uh, yeah. at Sabancı Holding or at Koç Holding because the remaining 50%, uh, 60% is still uh, with the founder. Indeed. Over there, uh, you have to change your uh, game plan. Mm -hmm. uh, in emerging markets, you will focus more on minority deals okay. or majority deals, but never a full ownership deal. Yes. Uh, it has another reason why you have to go down this path, because most of the emerging uh, country companies are family-owned yes. companies. Uh, and the first generation is probably still uh, managing the company, Indeed. and uh, they don't. Uh, they are have huge growth potentials because the country is growing very rapidly. The industry is growing rapidly. Yes. Uh, the company is doing great, mm. so they don't want to uh, give uh, full ownership of the company. Yes. And they would like to write with you mm. to benefit from the upside potential. Indeed, indeed. So uh, in this uh, in this case, you will look uh, for either minority deals mm. or a majority deals up to sixty percent, seventy percent. Okay. And you will bet on the uh, founder yes. that uh, they will continue. Uh, to do a magnificent job, yes. and they will uh, bring this company to the next level 
under your uh, supervision with your support. Yes, fantastic. I, I heard of another use case um, in, I think it was Germany, where, you know, the SMEs power, you know, a lot of the economy, but there are a lot exactly. of first generation founders who, you know, they'd go into se uh, secession planning and their, um, their children didn't want the businesses. And so the private equity firms would come along. Yeah, this is uh, another uh, another uh, characteristics of the uh, private equity, and it works especially uh, in Europe because in Europe you have uh, like hundred and fifty years old uh, family owned businesses. They are still family owned. Yes. Uh, probably second generation, third generation, but succession is an issue over there. Yes. Uh, when it gets. Uh, too old, this means there is the third generation, fifth generation, and it means the share, uh, the ownership is fragmented mm -hmm. a lot. Some of them uh, would like to uh, liquidate their shares. Yes. Or uh, we even uh, come across to the cases where the second generation consists of two brothers or a brother and sister. Yes. And they don't like each other. Oh, no. And this brings the company uh, to a, a sudden stop. Indeed. Deadlock uh, position. Yes. Especially if they have 50 50 uh, equal uh, uh, shareholdership. Yes. So it becomes really dangerous. Yeah. Uh, in that sense, for family owned businesses, private equity could really uh, play a, a major role. Mm -hmm. Either it could help with the succession planning, yes, or uh, could help uh, to solve the uh, family feuds, yes, uh, that's <laughs> running uh, deep in there, or uh, to uh, grant liberty uh, to the owners who would like to exit uh, from the uh, company. Okay, and uh, at the end of the day. Uh, you know, it's a win-win uh, situation. Yes, indeed. The families benefit from the contribution of the uh, private equity as a, a, a neutral third-party uh, shareholder. Yes. Uh, so to say, and the private equities uh, benefit from the uh, families' know-how in this business, from the families' uh, reputation. Yes. In this business. And also bear in mind, uh, with these turbulent times, mm -hmm. having access to capital markets is uh, becoming uh, really more and more difficult. Yeah, indeed. For the family-owned companies, they rely on the bank loans most mm -hmm. of the time. But uh, when the uh, stagnation uh, kicks in, uh, when there are, you know, uh, when the economies are contracting, yes. uh, their revenues will decline, mm. the share of the debt will increase in their balance sheet, yes. therefore they will have difficulty in getting more loan yes. from the banks yes. to finance their investments or networking capital needs mm -hmm. or to restructure their existing debt. Yes. Uh, then you can uh, claim, okay, why don't they go and list themselves yes. uh, in the in a stock exchange and uh, raise the money from the public? Well, during this period, uh, it would be even more uh, challenging for them mm -hmm. to uh, you know to do an IPO. Yes. Uh, then what is the uh, last resort? It would be uh, to raise equity yes. uh, for the company. Either they will accept the proposal from a competitor mm. and uh, bring them in as a strategic investor, or they will uh, go and collaborate with the private equity house. Yes. Uh, in this case, they rather go for private equity instead of a strategic owner mm. because they are scared that the strategic owner will eventually uh dilute their shares to consecutive capital increases and will get uh, the control of their company and they will be kicked out of their company yes but with private equity this is uh, not really a real threat mm. because private equity wants to keep you there 
Yes. And yes. he has to grow with you. And if you want to exit, you are going to exit together at a higher price tag. Indeed, indeed. Uh, for them, it is uh, much more attractive uh, to go uh, with the private equity than a strategic partner. Yes. And I think one of my favorite examples of that is, you know, you look at a multiple that you can get from a competitor as opposed to, let's say, a large company that's not in a particular sector. And so they come in through the private equity firm because they can cross sell all of their other products. They exactly. can offer a higher valuation. Um, I mean, we've covered a great deal today. Um, yes, we did. Yeah. I did most of the talking. <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you to do a little bit more talking. Um, uh, you know, there are many students who are really lucky to have you as a teacher. Um, but if you could share sort of three key takeaways um, for listeners, uh, it could be about, you know, careers, um, uh, you know, in the professional sense or any sort of three key takeaways that you would recommend to people based upon you know, your career and your experience? Well, I mean, uh, it's a difficult question, uh, Lucas. Uh, can I just list the three uh, key takeaways? Well, first of all, uh, I will, I will uh, share with you three quotes, yes. if you allow me. Of course. Uh, as one of your one of your classmates says, uh, I never lose. <laughs> I either win or learn. Yes. Uh, in your career, uh, we, you will have ups and downs, uh, but the downs are as uh, valuable as the uh, victories uh, that you enjoy. Yes. As long as we learn from them, and uh, this is actually. Uh, uh, one of the key criteria is when the uh, when the seed capital investors, venture capital investors, uh, evaluate uh, opportunity. Yes. They check the entrepreneur. Okay. They uh, check how many times he or she failed yes. before. Uh, they never invest into an entrepreneur who has not failed before. Mm. Interesting. Yes. yes. That, that that's interesting because. Uh, if it's your first time, you will be, uh, you don't know how to fail. Yes. Well. Yeah. And uh, if you come across to a person who failed several times, then you believe that uh, they learned from the uh, mistakes they did. Yes. And uh, the likelihood of a success in this round uh, will increase. Yes. Yes. So we have to cherish our failures as much as we do our uh, victories because they all teach us. Fantastic quote. The second takeaway is uh, from a, a, a sailing race. Uh, there, there's a round the globe uh, sailing race and uh, you know in one of them uh, this person was in the third rank and there was no way yes. for him to catch up with the uh, leaders. Mm -hmm. But he kept on uh, sailing. Then uh, the first two guys, they were sailing very aggressively. One of them crashed uh, into a, a underwater rocks. Yes. The other one uh, just capsized mm -hmm. and they were out of the game uh, and he finished. Yes. Okay. Yeah. What is this uh, sto uh, moral of the story? To finish first, first you have to finish. Indeed. Indeed. Okay. Perseverance. You will stick to your game plan. If you have a good game plan, no matter what your competitors are doing, uh, stick to it. Uh, keep calm. Yes. And, uh, and carry on. <laughs> and carry on. Uh, and uh, probably uh, you will finish as the uh, first one. So the third one would be not to forget to enjoy this, uh, right? Uh, you know, uh, it is not all about how you are financially successful, so on and so forth. Yes. But uh, you know, if you enjoy what you are doing, you will be successful eventually. Mm -hmm. And uh, your success will bring financial monetary rewards as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and during this period of time, 
you shouldn't uh, forget uh, also the work-life balance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to enjoy, you should take good care of yourself. You should take care, good care of your uh, family. Yes. Uh, and there should be balance. If there is an imbalance, mm -hmm. uh, you are you will not be fulfilling yourself. Indeed, indeed. Mm -hmm. Very wise words, Ahmed. Thank You're you. You're welcome. <laughs> Look, thank you so much for joining us once again. And Shok to Shekhar, that is. Rica ederim. Teşekkürler çağırdığın için. Thank you. Adamsın. <laughs> Sen adamsın. <laughs> what does that due diligence process look like? 